The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on American civil liberties during the COVID-19 pandemic. Without objection, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, will be able to participate in today's hearing for the purpose of questioning witnesses if a member uh, of the subcommittee yields him time for that purpose. Now, before I recognize myself for an opening statement, uh, we have a video uh, prepared um, on behalf of the committee. Schools, businesses, nearly every aspect of American life shut down. Biden and Harris called for this nationwide mandate. It's not about your rights, it's about your responsibilities. Just think of this when you think of vaccination. Mm. This is not about freedom or personal choice. New pandemic restrictions are coming into effect tonight. Put into practice the 15 days to slow the spread. A statewide order for people to stay at home. To get into these venues, they include bars, restaurants, nightclubs, conference centers. For domestic travel, for interstate travel, for planes, trains, interstate buses. Mr. Rodney Howard Brown is accused of defiantly leading two heavily attended church services. Mayor Michael Hancock told residents of his city to skip large Thanksgiving dinners. Restaurants must close up their dining rooms by 10 p.m. To use lockdowns to get people vaccinated. New York City schools, the largest in the nation, on the brink of shutting down. The Pentagon says it will not give back pay to military members who refuse to get the COVID-19 vaccine. There will be a civil fine and mandatory closure for any business that is not in compliance. Now is the time to do what you're told. <laughs> I'm not going to sign any bill that takes authority away from me. Many of us are frustrated with the nearly 80 million Americans we're still not vaccinated. Democratic leaders apologizing or reversing course after multiple occurrences of do as I say, not as I do. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin, and your refusal has cost all of us. Dr. Fauci and the NIAID as a sponsor of a research. I want to know what their scientific evidence is that we need to have children as young as two being forced to wear a mask. He was engaged in a massive, but a very effective cover-up of his funding of gain of function research at the Wuhan lab. I am strongly in favor of mandating. I now recognize, recognize myself for an opening statement. I thank our witnesses for being here today. The government response to the COVID-19 pandemic triggered some of the most aggressive usurpations of freedom present day Americans have experienced. When we look back at the trillions of dollars spent, the immeasurable loss of freedom, the loss of jobs and businesses, the lost confidence in public health, and the immense societal harm created, Americans deserve to know it will not happen again. Every level of government, federal, state, and local, to some degree took part in this attack on the liberty of the American people. And corporate America, academia, and the media were happy to oblige. An apology, if we are lucky to get one, does not change the fact that the effects of COVID-19 tyranny are permanent if we don't act to change them. I will remind both my Democrat and Republican colleagues that the liberties reflected in our Constitution are not optional, and as a general matter, should not be suspended for political expediency nor times of crises. In fact, the Constitution was written to constrain the power of government and secure liber liberty that the founders knew would be challenged specifically in those times of crises. On March 16, 2020, the Trump administration announced, quote, 15 days to slow the spread. And far too few government leaders did anything to stop the unconstitutional tyranny that would follow over the past four years. Four days after that announcement, I wrote an op-ed in National Review urging, urging Americans that we need a, quote, date certain to return to their normal lives or the government action in response to the pandemic would be worse than the virus itself. A year after 15 days to slow the spread, I wrote another op-ed calling for an end to the capacity limits on businesses, rules about what the vaccinated could and couldn't do inside and outside, and vaccine passports. But here we are. It was clear the COVID-19 measures were not about science or safety, but compliance and control. With the strong urging of the federal government, with particular propaganda from doctors Fauci and Burks, by late April of 2020, 42 states, collectively leading approximately 316 million people, were subject to stay-at-home orders violating their fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Churches across the country were subject to strict social distancing and attendance limitations, while favored businesses were allowed to carry on, violating freedom of religion guaranteed in the First Amendment. Perhaps most egregiously, here in D.C., Mayor Browser joined thousands in Black Lives Matter protests while effectively banning church services for groups greater than 10 people. 
The, church, the White House and the CDC colluded with social media companies to suppress opposing views related to COVID-19, ranging from ivermectin to vaccine and mask mandates, violating freedom of speech protected in the First Amendment, in addition to common sense. Many Democratic governors did not consider gun stores to be essential businesses during the lockdowns while considering marijuana dispensaries and liquor stores essential, undermining the Second Amendment. States forcibly closed businesses and deemed certain essential and others non-essential, and the CDC implemented a 120-day eviction moratorium, many of which would arguably violate the Fifth Amendment, which requires government compensation for the taking of private property for public use or public purpose. COVID-19 measures delayed court proceedings, undermining Amer Americans' right to a speedy trial protected by the Sixth Amendment, and I could go on and on. These constitutionally problematic government actions inflicted intense societal damage. We are still seeing the results and the consequences. The American economy experienced $14 trillion in damages due to lockdowns and governmental measures. The United States spent $6 trillion in the name of COVID, more than what the United States spent on World War II in today's dollars. This led to rampant inflation that has yet to subside. One recent analysis found that the typical American household must spend an additional $11,400 annually just to maintain the same standard of living they enjoyed of January 21 right before inflation soared to 40-year highs. Forced school closures and remote schooling erased decades of progress for students in math and reading and resulted in a quarter of our nation's students being chronically absent. We saw record high suicides, an increase of 5,000 from before the pandemic and almost 50,000 annually, and drug overdoses hit 100,000 a year. Tens of millions of Americans lost their jobs and were forced onto government assistance. In April 2020, the unemployment rate hit 15%, an all-time high since the data has been recorded. Over 100 million Americans were forced to take a vaccine with a veiled threat, your job or the jab. Regardless of what radical progressive Democrats want to claim, these vaccines were not voluntary. The federal government mandated vaccines for military personnel, healthcare workers, government contractors, and all businesses with more than 100 workers. The Biden administration bragged that their mandates covered more than two-thirds of American workers. The government lied about its efficacy and effectiveness to make these mandates more palatable. Dr. Fauci said it is as simple as black and white. You're vaccinated, you're safe, you're unvaccinated, you're at risk. Simple as that. Not sure the truth has borne that out. Former CDC Director uh, Rochelle Walensky said the following, our data from the CDC today suggests that vaccinated people do not carry the virus, don't get sick. They teased the prospect of freedom if we would just suck it up and do what they said. How did that work out? They were dead wrong and instead we got one of the biggest bait and switches of all time. We decided to inject 700 million people with vaccines regardless of the risk COVID-19 poses to them. Here's the aftermath. A million adverse events from the COVID-19 countermeasures have been reported to the government. Only 11 have been compensated, while Big Pharma enjoys complete immunity from liability stemming from COVID-19 vaccine injury. Hundreds of thousands of small businesses shut down permanently while big businesses like Amazon, Walmart, and Target raked in billions. All of this for the CDC to announce last month to treat COVID-19 infections like the flu. What are we going to do to ensure our liberties are protected going forward? What are, you, what are we going to do to ensure that unelected public health bureaucrats who promoted this on the American people are held accountable? We need to pass emergency powers reforms to ensure Congress can stop the expansion of the size and scope of government during times of crisis. We need to stop the funding of organizations that perpetuated this tyranny like the United Nations World Health Organization, not accede to their power as may be occurring this month. We should pass legislation to enhance congressional oversight of the runaway health care bureaucracy. We need to hold officials like Dr. Fauci and Burks accountable. God forbid something like this were to happen again. We should reject mandates, vaccine mandates, mass mandates, lockdowns, and trillion-dollar spending bills. This is a good place to start. We will likely hear the following today. We should view our response to the COVID-19 pandemic as a success. We should give the people in charge the benefit of the doubt since it was a stressful and uncertain time. Sure, there are things we can improve upon for the next pandemic, but freedom is just one factor in the many complicated case-by-case -case calculations governments must make. Ignore all of this. Our rights are not to be negotiated. No matter how much they try to change the subject or rewrite history, we should never forget what they did to us. We must not be the victim of another government science experiment ever again. And that's exactly why we're here today. And I appreciate the witnesses for being here. And I will now recognize the ranking member, the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When the chairman noticed this hearing about liberty and tyranny, one might have wondered if our Republican colleagues wanted to have a real discussion about the civil rights and liberties guaranteed to all Americans.
But given that this hearing is being convened by the same majority that changed the name of this subcommittee from the sub subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties to the Consti subcommittee on the Constitution and Limited Government, it's no surprise that civil rights and liberties are once again taking a backseat to culture wars. Because you can't have a hearing on liberty without mentioning one of the most important civil liberties issues facing our country today. A woman's freedom to make existential decisions about her own health care without the meddling of politicians. And you can't have a hearing about tyranny without acknowledging that a person being denied medical care because of someone else's political or religious beliefs is certainly an exercise of tyranny. Since the Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade two years ago, state legislatures nationwide have passed laws that threaten women's reproductive health care with medically unnecessary restrictions. One in three women of reproductive age lives in a state with an abortion ban. Doctors and pharmacists doing their jobs and even women who suffer miscarriages have been threatened with criminal charges. Women who are denied access to health care are vulnerable to <coughs> harm and even sometimes death. To be clear, the Supreme Court's misguided Dobbs decision did not take away a woman's underlying right to the freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions, but it did take away an important legal protection. At a time when a majority of the public, 62%, disapproves of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe, Congress must pass the Women's Health Protection Act to enshrine this fundamental freedom into law. Now, with all that said, and despite the subjection of women currently occurring across America, reproductive freedom is, of course, not the topic chosen for today's hearing by our Republican colleagues. Instead, they're proving yet again that their supposed passion for limited government is, in fact, a passion for imposing the political and religious views of a noisy, far-right majority on all Americans. Today's hearing is a destructive exercise of revisionist history, so let's try to correct the record a little bit. Four years ago, our public health officials faced a daunting crisis, the global spread of COVID-19. I find it very disturbing that the majority in its effort to uh, cast legitimate public health measures as tyranny just showed a very misleading video in which they also tried to blame the Biden administration for actions which were implemented under the Trump administration. But the actual history, public servants had to make critical decisions confronted with limited information and a mounting death toll to keep people safe from a fast-moving and deadly disease for which there was, at least initially, no cure, no treatment, and no vaccine. They utilized broad powers based on long-standing Supreme Court precedent and statutory authority. They acted in good faith to keep our communities healthy the best that they could under existing knowledge. Yet it's these very efforts to keep people safe that our MAGA colleagues want to paint as tyrannical here today. It is a deeply cynical view of government that I wholeheartedly reject. For two centuries, courts have recognized that the states possess significant general police power under the Constitution to respond to public health threats. For two, um, of course, the Constitution commands that individual rights must be protected, even in an emergency, and rightly so. Yet courts have also recognized that even a fundamental constitutional right is not absolute. It's important to recognize that the idea of freedom espoused by our founders is not, as some of our colleagues suggest, a right completely devoid of personal responsibility. From experience in my own community, I know that our public health leaders' decisions, especially early on in the pandemic, saved countless lives. Because during a public health emergency, individual decisions are not isolated. They affect other people. While one person might be willing to risk illness or death in exchange for going without a mask or a vaccine, not everyone is. And people can suffer when their fellow, fellow Americans make irresponsible choices. When our framers gathered in Philadelphia to write the Constitution, they were explicit about the purposes of that founding document, which included promoting the general welfare. But how can we do that if our leaders don't embrace basic steps to keep people safe and healthy in extraordinary circumstances? which is, I'll add, something our government's done throughout our nation's history. George Washington mandated smallpox, smallpox inoculations for all Continental soldiers in 1777. 
In 1918, Dwight Eisenhower, then commanding the Army's Tank Corps at Camp Gold in Pennsylvania, in Gettysburg, su successfully controlled the influenza epidemic among his troops by employing familiar strategies like quarantining, masking, disinfecting, ventilating, and making sure that everyone was up to date on their vaccines. That experience informed his later advocacy as president to vaccinate all Americans to eradicate polio. We could have used this hearing today to seriously discuss how best to protect our national public health against future pandemics. That includes how to best strike a balance between safeguarding individual rights and ensuring the public good. Instead, our Republican colleagues want to rehash old culture wars and sow mistrust in public health. And they're giving a platform to vaccine skeptics to peddle more dangerous conspiracy theories and public health misinformation. We're already seeing the insidious effects of vaccine skepticism as infectious and serious diseases we once thought were contained, like measles, are spreading again, especially among school children. With this hearing today, our mega Republican colleagues are once again trying to force their bleak and divisive vision of our country on everyone. It's a vision where congressional power is wielded to intimidate public servants, reject the common good, and abandon our most vulnerable fellow Americans. It's not responsible governance. It's not government at all. Americans deserve so much better. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. I thank the chairman um, and for having this hearing. It, I think it's nicely with what we did just last week when it was we were talking about freedom of the press. Um, the former attorney general said the Constitution is not suspended during a crisis. In fact, I would argue that's when it's the most important. And it was certainly during COVID, government attacked Americans' rights saying we were in a pandemic, in a, in a crisis. Um, and I'll just say some of the same things I said last week at the start of that hearing. Every single liberty we enjoy under the First Amendment was assaulted during COVID. Every single one. I mean, you had, you had people tell Americans they couldn't go to church on Sunday. Holy cow. I always use the example. I spoke to the New Mexico, your right to assemble. You think I, all five rights, right? To practice your faith, right to assemble, uh, freedom of the press, free speech, and your right to petition the government. All five were, were, were attacked. I, I tell the story many times. I spoke to the New Mexico Republican Party in Amarillo, Texas, because they had to leave their own darn state where they pay taxes to go to another state where they had the freedom to actually get together because their Democrat governor wouldn't let them do it in their own state. Um, your right to petition your government. You wanted to talk to your member of Congress for two years. You couldn't go talk to him in, the, in your Congress, in your Capitol that you pay for because Nancy Pelosi wouldn't let you in. You had, to go, you had to meet him somewhere else. Couldn't meet him at your Capitol. Free press. I was using the example. Jen Psaki stood at the podium probably two years ago, I guess, stood at the podium in the White House, in the press room, talking to the press, and she said these two sentences. Most Americans now get their news from social media platforms. We, the Biden administration, are working to limit what those social media platforms can post. I mean, think about the irony. The press person in the press room talking to the press about restricting the press. It's crazy. But the biggest one, of course, is speech. That's the one they go after. And I tell people all the time, if you can't talk, it's the most important right you have, because if you can't talk, you can't practice your faith, can't share your faith, can't petition your government, you don't have it, we don't have a free press. That's the one they go after, this censorship effort, which this committee and the select committee have spent a boatload of our time trying to get to. That's the scariest one of all. So this, this hearing's important. Here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. So many of the things they told us when they were restricting our First Amendment liberties during, the, during the, the pandemic, so many of the things that particularly the Biden administration told us turned out to be wrong. Bad enough, you gotta give up your rights when you give them up when they're telling you for, for, for wrong reasons. I mean, you could go down the list. They told us it wasn't our tax dollars used in the lab in China. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. They told us they weren't doing gain-of-function research. Yes, they were. They told us it didn't start in the lab. They didn't start in the lab. Sure looks like it did, but they want us to believe it was a bat to a pangolin to a hippopotamus to Joe Rogan, and then we all get the virus, right? That's what they want us to think. I kind of think it started in the lab. But no, 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 we're all stupid. They're so much smarter than us, and they're going to restrict our liberties while they're telling us they're smarter than us, even though they were wrong. They said the vaccinated couldn't get it. They said the vaccinated couldn't transmit it. They said masks work. 
They said kids couldn't go to school. That was a good, I mean, you can just keep going down the list. Maybe, here's the other one. They said, for the first time in history, we have a virus where there's no natural immunity. Wow, groundbreaking. So this hearing is important. We, we need, because just for the simple purpose of reminding the country how wrong they were while they were taking away our freedoms, while they were attacking the First Amendment. So I appreciate our chairman for putting this together, and I really appreciate our witnesses and the strong positions they've already taken, saying some of these things already. God bless you for doing all that, and thank you for being here today. I yield back. I thank the chairman of the committee, Mr. Jordan. I would now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your uh, announcement a little while ago that 700 million people were vaccinated out of a population of 330 million. Quite an accomplishment. Mr. Chairman, our former colleague and current ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, is often quoted as saying, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. I believe that my Republican colleagues think, think that this idea applies to the topic of today's hearing. The COVID-19 pandemic was a serious public health crisis. And four years later, House Republicans are still attempting to capitalize on that global trauma for political spin. Today's hearing is nothing more than a platform for extreme MAGA Republicans to spread skepticism of public health officials to advance the conservative persecution complex that has become the cornerstone of their political identity. Any reasonable reading of the facts from that time makes it clear that this portrayal is a bogus, politically motivated hit job. Public health officials at the local, state, and federal levels are dedicated public servants who, at the time, had to act on the limited information available in response to a nationwide public health crisis. The facts demonstrate that they took reasoned, good faith actions in response to an infectious disease that even to this day quite literally continues to evolve. I would note, however, that the House Judiciary Committee has no expertise on matters of public health policy or medical science. If the Republicans wanted a discussion about lessons learned from the nation's experience with COVID-19, I would welcome it. As to whether officials had the authority to take the steps that they did, that authority was, and largely remains, broad at, even after years of legal challenges stemming from the pandemic. That is to say that while individual constitutional rights are always in force, even during a public health emergency, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. No legal right is absolute, and the Constitution itself accounts for the need for government to respond to protect the nation from serious threats. Given the chaotic and uncertain circumstances in which they were operating, not every decision by a public health official may have struck the ideal balance between the need to protect public health and respect for individual rights. That is why we have a court system. Nonetheless, overall, those public officials' decisions were made in good faith and saved countless lives during a public health emergency involving a novel and rapidly spreading infectious disease that was killing more than 1,000 people a day in the early part of the pandemic and which so far has killed more than a million Americans. Individuals may have varying tolerances for personal risk, but individual choices about vaccination, quarantining, masking, or other public health measures can also seriously affect other people's health. In particular, the most vulnerable members of our society are at risk during an event involving an infectious disease. This includes the very young, the very old, those with pre-existing conditions, and the working poor who historically lack access to health care and are disproportionately represented among ethnic and racial minorities. According to the apparent viewpoint of extreme MAGA Republicans, the government should have done nothing during the pandemic to protect the public while vulnerable Americans were left to fend for themselves. That is not my idea of freedom. This apparent callousness demonstrates that, for some of our colleagues, Public health policy is just another angle from which to cast government officials as power-hungry bureaucrats to suit their narrow political interests, no matter what the facts may be. But while the MAGA Republicans may think that a revisionist hearing like this, relitigating re the government response to the COVID-19 pandemic, to recast it as a tyrannic, tyrannical power grab, is a political winner, there is, in fact, no winner. Instead, the American people will lose. Politicizing public health policy has real consequences, 
for the American people, even outside of a once in a century pandemic. One must look no further than the impact that vaccine skepticism has had on the spread of infectious diseases that we once thought contained, but that are now spreading again because of people like Dr. Ladabo who tell us myths about vaccines. I would just write today's hearing off as yet another MAGA extremist rant were it not for the corrosive impact on Americans' trust in public health officials. The American public deserves better than this hearing. I thank the witnesses and I yield back. I thank the uh, ranking member for uh, his remarks. I would only note that the, the commentary about 700 million um, uh, Americans uh, or individuals receiving vaccines because there was multiple rounds of vaccines administered. And so there were 700 million administrations of vaccines, so 700 million people received vaccines. A lot of those were the same persons getting two, three, four, five versions of it. But uh, that's the fact, there were 700 million vaccines administered. Um, and I would also note that we are uniquely suited in the Judiciary Committee to deal with issues involving constitutional questions and the size and scope of government in response to what the chairman said. Um, but that, I was just responding, responding to what the ranking member said. And, well, I mean, the ranking member takes uh, his uh, uh, time to uh, question what the opening statement is the chairman. I wanted to respond to it. So with that, I'm going to introduce the witnesses and thank them for, for being here. First, I'd like to recognize Ms. Harmeet Dillon. Ms. Dillon is a nationally recognized civil rights lawyer and the founder and chief executive officer of the Center for American Liberty. The Center for American Liberty is a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending the civil liberties of Americans. She is a graduate of Dartmouth College and the University of Virginia School of Law. Uh, Dr. Joseph Latipo. Dr. Latipo is the Surgeon General of the state of Florida and a professor at the University of Florida College of Medicine. He previously served as an associate professor at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, on the faculty at the NYU School of Medicine, and as a staff fellow at the Food and Drug Administration. Dr. Latipo completed his undergraduate studies at Wake Forest University, earned his medical degree from Harvard Medical School, and earned a PhD in health policy from Harvard. Uh, next, I would introduce Ms. Claudine Gohagen. Ms. Gohagen is a visiting fellow at the Independent Women's Forum. She is also a co-founder of Freedom in Education, a nonprofit organization that works to enhance education and increase educational opportunities for children. Ms. Gohagen is a former elementary school teacher. Finally, Professor Michelle Bratcher Goodwin. Ms. Goodwin is the Linda D. and Timothy J. O'Neill Professor of Constitutional Law and Global Health Policy at the Georgetown University Law School. She is also the co-faculty director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. Professor Goodwin previously served as a chancellor's professor at UC Irvine and as the Abraham Panansky Visiting Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative and they may be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask you that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. Ms. Dillon, you may begin. Wait, your mic, Ms. Dillon. Good afternoon, Chairman Roy, Ranking Member Scanlon, and members of this committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify before you on a topic that I believe to be the most significant civil rights crisis of my lifetime. The use of so-called COVID emergency to eviscerate Americans' most cherished constitutionally protected freedoms. During the pandemic, we witnessed the radical dismantling of the guardrails that the framers of our Constitution specifically designed to rein in imperious government actors. In the guise of emergency, government officials is insti instituted unlimited executive fiats to control and curtail every aspect of our lives. These actions by the government were not narrowly tailored nor based on credible science, and as such, the government's escalating and often arbitrary restrictions were not meaningfully limited. The government closed our schools, locked down our houses of worship, destroyed our small businesses, criminalized our free speech, banned travel, kept us from our loved ones at their most desperate hours, even shut down the beaches of Orange County and the skate parks so that children could not play. 
the government wrested unchecked and unprecedented control from the American people and the vast majority of American elected officials from both parties assumed their heretofore unimaginable powers with no qualms about history, precedent, or the consequences. Thankfully, due to a wave of legal challenges against these restrictions, the Supreme Court eventually issued rulings that, piece by piece, returned some measure of protection to our threatened First Amendment rights, while others remain exposed and eroded to this day. COVID demonstrated just how vulnerable these rights are without affirmative protection from judicially unchecked government overreach. At any given time today, a state or federal government official could declare an emergency or fabricate some unfounded excuse and suspend our fundamental rights once again. Most courts will not stop them, as we have unfortunately seen. It is imperative that Congress intervene to make sure that the COVID legal history cannot and will not repeat itself. One of the most egregious violations of our First Amendment freedoms was the treatment of religious Americans as second-class citizens, as vectors of disease. From the very beginning of the pandemic, governors across the country discriminately labeled houses of worship and by extension the First Amendment as quote unquote non-essential, while at the same time leaving their secular counterparts open for business. In my state, California, marijuana, liquor, and big box retailers were deemed essential, but God was banned. There were different rules for the elites compared to the people as well. A member of this committee, Congresswoman Bush, held protests on the steps of the Capitol while Nancy Pelosi barred our client, a reverend, Patrick Mahoney, from praying at the same place. The Center for American Liberty and my law firm represented several American faithful citizens in their fight to live according to their religious beliefs. In three of these cases, the United States Supreme Court agreed with us. Gish versus Newsom, South Bay United Pentecostal Church versus Newsom, and Tandon versus Newsom. We represented pastors and congregants in California who did everything they could to keep their churches doors open safely. They offered distancing, they offered sanitization, they offered masking, but none of it was good enough for the government. This discrimination against religious Americans did not end once restrictions lifted. We currently represent three individuals who were fired from the North Carolina Symphony, where they requested religious exemptions to the vaccine mandate. All three musicians submitted exemption requests that included guarantees they would take additional social distancing and masking measures to avoid violating anybody else's rights. But this was not good enough. The symphony denied the requests and fired these musicians who remain fired to this day. Even though the symphony has lifted its vaccine mandate, as a result of these discriminatory actions, these artists lost their livelihoods and the American dream. These violations of our civil rights were made possible by the lack of due process and judicial scrutiny during the pandemic. When governors invoked emergency status, many federal judges threw all three standards of scrutiny, rational basis, intermediate, and strict scrutiny to the wind in the name of an emergency. I heard judge after judge chillingly dismiss rulings in our cases challenging government overreach. This complete disregard for a critical check was a result of an outdated Supreme Court ruling Jacobson versus Massachusetts, which hails from even before the Jim Crow era in our country and yet remains the law in this country to this day. Jacobson handed unbridled power to the government to declare when an emergency occurred and what to do about it. There was no room for judges to make their own rules based on facts, experts, and the law. Executive fiat was rubber stamped and our, Congress and our fundamental rights abridged. In conclusion, I urge Congress to enact legislation that limits the federal government's ability to use outdated legislation and rulings like Jacobson and others to curtail our constitutional freedoms and to apply instead modern tiered scrutiny and due process analysis developed by the courts. No emergency, especially one defined by the government, should warrant the erosion of our freedoms and a complete disregard for the judicial scrutiny the courts use to preserve them in every other instance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. Dr. Latipo. Thank you. Chairman Roy, Ranking Member Scanlon, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's an honor to appear before you today to discuss liberty, tyranny, and accountability, COVID-19 and the Constitution. My name is Dr. Joe Latipo, and I currently serve as Florida State Surgeon General and also as a professor at the University of Florida. I was born in Nigeria and immigrated to the United States when I was five years old with my family. After graduating from Wake Forest University, I earned my medical degree from Harvard Medical School 
and a PhD in health policy from Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. When COVID-19 hit the United States in 2020, I felt the heavy hand of California's public health policy, this is a recurring theme, not only as a resident, father, and a husband, but also as a professor and a hospitalist physician at UCLA taking care of patients with COVID and other medical conditions. I saw fear supplant thoughtful decision-making. In contrast, as I looked to Florida, it was clear that Governor DeSantis was laser-focused on evidence-based approaches to COVID-19. Since the beginning, Governor DeSantis took courageous steps to ensure that his pandemic response decisions were rooted in data and served his population, even when these decisions were wildly unpopular. With over six million senior residents, the highest risk of serious illness and death, Governor DeSantis prioritized access to COVID-19 vaccines for them, a deviation from CDC recommendations at the time. A few months later, the CDC followed his lead. The invitation to serve as Florida State Surgeon General came in August of 2021. Escaping the tyranny of California sounded like a breath of fresh air. And most importantly, my wife said okay. While many states required proof of vaccination to leave their front door, Florida outlawed COVID-19 vaccine passes. Governor DeSantis refused to let the fear that gripped our nation shape the state of Florida, and he ensured that personal liberties would be protected. Florida has led the nation by codifying permanent health protections to ensure medical freedom, protect jobs, and prohibit COVID-19 vaccine and mask mandates. While other states locked the doors of schools, Florida was the first state in the nation to mandate in-person learning for students and welcome students back into the classroom. As the federal government continued to solely rely on preventive strategies that were not halting transmission, Florida launched the nation's first monoclonal antibody treatment network. The life-saving treatment minimized the risk of severe illness and alleviated pressure on our hospitals. At their peak, 25 sites were serving as many as 5,000 patients a day. Unfortunately, the federal government made it increasingly difficult for Florida to receive the supply of treatments that, because they maintained control of supply and allocation. Eventually, U.S. Health and Human Services eliminated access to any monoclonal antibody treatment. These policy decisions were not clinically sensible, and Florida was forced to cancel 2,000 appointments overnight among high-risk patients with COVID-19 across the state. Meanwhile, global research had been detecting risks associated with COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Data continued to surface on adverse events, including myocarditis, acute cardiac injuries, Bell's palsy, encephalitis, and other blood clotting events. Even the FDA themselves identified safety signals among seniors following COVID-19 vaccine administration. To this day, this evidence is largely ignored and often smeared as hysteria or myths. Americans are not pharmaceutical guinea pigs. Based on years of evidence across the world and lack of transparency from the FDA and CDC, I called for a halt to the use of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines earlier this year. In 2022, Governor DeSantis petitioned the Florida Supreme Court for a statewide grand jury to investigate crimes committed against Floridians related to COVID-19. This year, the first interim report of these findings revealed exactly what we are here today to discuss. They concluded that mask mandates and lockdowns did more harm than good, resulting in depression, excuse me, substance abuse, and suicidal behavior. The jury also found that higher excess mortality occurred in lockdown areas and that CDC COVID-19 hospitalization data were likely inflated due to financial incentives that impacted reporting. Unfortunately, the WHO is in the process of drafting a pandemic treaty. This treaty would expand the power, their power, in response to a pandemic, and this would have pernicious implications for the sovereignty of the United States and our citizens here. Under the leadership of Governor DeSantis, Florida has always been a leader in protecting personal freedoms. I'm honored to be here today to discuss these issues. I'm grateful to the committee's commitment to upholding individual liberties and common sense, and I'm very grateful to the committee's recognition that these impulses to curtail individual rights and overcome personal responsibility and, and individual liberty are still present and unfortunately just as strong as, ever, as they ever were four years ago. Thank you, Dr. Ladapo. Ms. Gohagan. Chairman Roy, Ranking Member Scanlon, and members of the subcommittee, 
Thank you for inviting me to appear today. My name is Beanie Gohagen. I'm a visiting fellow at the Independent Women's Forum, an educator, and the mother of four children, three sons and one daughter, all of whom were pr profoundly impacted by the cruel COVID era policies. My daughter is here with me today. We live in Jefferson County, Kentucky. While the government response to COVID affected all of my children differently, today I will focus on how the school closures delegitimized school for my youngest son, Colin. Colin always thrived in school, participated in activities and sports, was well-liked by his peers and teachers, and was even told by his fourth grade math teacher, Stacy Porter, that he would probably be president someday. This, kid, this was a kid who understood and appreciated the value of education and did not harbor any ill feelings toward school. Unfortunately, school closures changed that. They brought what is arguably the most fun time in high school to an abrupt halt for Colin and many other students who were robbed of so much during that time. March 13th, 2020 was a defining day in our home. My two oldest were home from college on an extended spring break that would last until August. As word spread that school was being canceled for two weeks to slow the spread, our family could not have imagined it would be the last day my two youngest children would see the inside of a public school classroom. Two weeks to slow the spread turned into 18 months to stunt my son's academic growth and delegitimize school for him. Virtual learning lessons usually equated to briefly logging on to get credit for attendance and listening to a teacher talk for a few minutes to give an assignment that may or may not have been relevant. To make matters worse, instead of capitalizing on all of the free time students had to read great books in English class, his teacher focused on topics like intersectionality and identity. Meanwhile, I was working with other parents locally trying to get our school board to reopen schools so our children could return to normal. One board member responded to my school closures concerns with, each of your emails is more absurd than the last. The particular email he's referring to reminded the board about the Everyday Counts campaign they launched before COVID school closures. When I emailed that Chicago Public Schools had found a way to reopen, another board member replied, feel free to move to Chicago. Meanwhile, Colin was becoming more frustrated and indifferent towards school. Despite his and his friends' indifference and lack of effort, they were awarded school diploma, high school diplomas. They knew they hadn't earned them since the expectations for the last 18 months were minimal, but they were ready to move past high school. A few months after Colin's socially distanced outdoor graduation ceremony, we moved him into his college dorm with his lifelong best friend. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, the bad habits and negative attitudes about school he had developed during virtual learning didn't translate into success at college. After three very discouraging semesters, he moved back home. Because he is a hardworking, industrious young man, he quickly found a job to keep him busy and earn money while he thought about his future. Many of his friends' parents shared that their sons and daughters struggled with similar issues. They seemed to be lost, unmoored from a sense of direction or purpose. A friend's daughter was a part of a nursing program in the public high school when schools closed. As a result, she didn't get the training she needed, therefore she could not pass the anatomy and math classes required in her first semester at the community college. Students like her incurred a greater financial burden because they had to pay for remedial college courses to cover material that their free public schools should have taught. To add salt to the wounds of many students, the leaders in my district boasted about the all-time high graduation rates in the years following school closures, even though only 23% of the students were proficient in reading and 21% performed the proficient level in math on state assessments. Public schools sent functionally illiterate and innumerate young people out into the workforce or world of higher education, woefully unprepared to thrive or flourish. Too many young people today, especially young men, do not feel prepared to take on adult responsibilities or the challenges of college life. In 2022, about one million fewer young men were in college than in 2011. Approximately one third of the students who have enrolled in college have dropped out. That can't be good for those individuals who spent the money, lost the time, and had their confidence tested. While everyone doesn't need to attain a college degree and plenty of noble careers out there do not require one, fewer people with college degrees will negatively impact our nation's economy. This will not be fixed by increasing funding to the very institutions that shut their doors to millions of students nationwide and left the parents to pick up the broken pieces. The solution was and is to allow families, not the government, to, dis to choose the best learning environment for their children. The families who had that choice during COVID are mostly free from this fallout because their schools reopened quickly. Since this is my son's story, I wanna conclude with his advice. There needs to be a better process to prevent something like this in the future. 
Families should have had a vote in school closures rather than the government deciding without their input. His peers felt hopeless about their future and witnessed their families' helplessness in directing their children's education. This must never happen again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gohagan. Professor Goodwin. Subcommittee Chairman Roy, Subcommittee Ranking Member Scanlon, and distinguished members of the House Judiciary Committee and Subcommittee on the Constitution and Limited Government, thank you very much for inviting me today. My name is Michelle Bratcher Goodwin. I am the Linda D. and Timothy J. O'Neill Professor of Constitutional Law and Global Health Policy at Georgetown University Law Center, where I'm also the co-director, co-faculty director of the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. COVID-19 is the greatest public health threat the United States has experienced in over a century. Not since 1918, the influenza pandemic has the nation experienced such a dramatic menace to its health. In its early months, reporters noted that COVID-19 in the United States by far led all other nations and confirmed coronavirus cases. Within barely one year, the death toll associated with COVID-19 exceeded a staggering 500,000 losses in the United States, compounded by more than 28 million confirmed cases. To place this suffering in context, more Americans died during the first three months of COVID-19 pandemic, over 100,000 by June 2020, than all American deaths suffered during the Vietnam War, the fatalities of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the deaths resulting from the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, Ebola and Zika virus all combined. In the first three months when fatalities were roughly 100,000, COVID-19 had killed more people in the United States than what Americans had witnessed in the past 50 years of war and disease combined. In essence, COVID-19 took barely two months to surpass deaths suffered by Americans in the 19 years of the Vietnam War. And while the Vietnam War is long over, as of this hearing, COVID-19 persists in the United States and throughout the world. While the range of deaths associated with this disease may be underreported, what is clear is its severity and the loss of lives. What the staggering death toll brings to light are two interrelated matters. First, it exposes questions related to capacity, compassion, and competency in American leadership, from the federal government down to local officials. The failure to heed international warnings and develop effective test kits in December 2019 and January 2020 highlights serious weaknesses in pandemic preparedness and American leadership. Hasty and imprudent political rhetoric in February and March of 2020 compared COVID-19 to seasonal flu was not only inaccurate and misguided, it likely contributed to a sense of false security amongst Americans who came to believe the virus was no more infectious and no greater a threat than the seasonal flu. Sadly, this view persists amongst some Americans, including in government. Second, fundamental questions of constitutional law have also emerged. The coronavirus crisis brought to the forefront a national debate related to the interactions between constitutional rights, states police power, and federalism. Namely, what are the limits of government action during a pandemic? One thing that we should take away from this is that Mandatory vaccination is constitutional. It's something that has been constitutional in our country since the Jacobson v. Ma Massachusetts decision and even before our own constitution dating back to 1738, we've had the upholding of quarantine and other measures to protect the public's health. The legality of compulsory vaccination is not a matter that is in question. In 1905, the Supreme Court held that state compulsory vaccination laws are constitutional when they are necessary for public health and for public safety. The case was Jack Jacobson v. Massachusetts, a case taught in first year constitutional law classes. In the years since then, the court has affirmed the constitutionality of state compulsory vaccination laws in cases like Zucked v. King, which upheld childhood vaccination requirements for entrance to public schools. In fact, compulsory vaccination laws have existed in the United States in some form since the 19th century. 
Much of that is detailed in my written testimony. I do want to flag, however, that there are times in which the government has exceeded its authority. In 1917, the American health officials in El Paso, Texas began a campaign known as gasoline baths to do so-called disinfection of people seeking to enter the United States. In 1927, in a case called Buck v. Bell, the United States Supreme Court upheld compulsory sterilization of poor white girls and boys who were thought to be unfit. We have seen time and time again where there has been the exceed of government authority when it has been the most vulnerable of people, most often racial minorities, who have been targeted under the umbrella of preserving the public health in ways that demean them and demean the dignity of our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Goodwin. Uh, we will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and the chair, uh, I will yield myself uh, the five minutes uh, on uh, questions. So, um, Dr. Latipo, uh, about 100 million Americans uh, were placed under essentially federal mandates with respect to vaccines. Some of those have been struck down, correct? That's correct. And, uh, but nevertheless, there were still a whole lot of pressures for people to be vaccinated and to get the vaccine or lose their job. Is that correct? Tremendous pressure, and many people, in fact, did lose their jobs. Can you expound on the extent to which both whether whatever happened in the grand jury or in your own observation, what has led you to believe that the mRNA vaccine, that vaccine should be taking a second look and shouldn't be out there, and your concerns about the health issues, the million cases that have been reported through the VAERS system, et cetera? Can you expound on your concerns about the vaccines? Sure. Thank you for that question, Chair. It's hard to be an honest person or have any relationship with honesty and not acknowledge that over the last few years, negative information, negative scientific findings, negative impressions about the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines have been to at least some extent suppressed. Most people, I think, with some relationship to honesty would agree that they have actually been quite strongly suppressed often. However, there are a number of scientists in this country who have been vocal about the problems with the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. It's, it's noteworthy to, to, uh, to view the fact that never in our history has there been, have there been so many physicians and other scientists who have been outspoken. It's unusual for scientists. Scientists usually pursue their, their science for, for you know, the benefit of, of their curiosity and research or for the benefit of human health. Scientists are usually not political, political figures. Do, do you share my concern that a mere 11 COVID countermeasure injury claims have been paid out through the compensation fund? Absolutely. Is that an astoundingly low number given the millions of Americans that have uh, been effectively forced uh, or strongly encouraged or coerced to take the vaccine? I think it's obvious and it would be hard for anyone with, again, any relationship to honesty and facts to deny that. Do you believe that that has been um, uh, somewhat encouraged by the extent to which there is liability protection for uh, vaccine manufacturers that dates back to 1986 and that we should at least revisit uh, the nature of liability protection for liability, I mean, for uh, pharmaceutical companies? I actually, personally, I, I completely agree with that. I think this liability protection for any medical product is something that really shouldn't exist. And it's partic particularly egregious when it's a product that's being mandated, whatever that medication might be. And to be clear, though, you, like me, are pro-vaccine, right? But tested vaccines and so forth. For example, my father had polio. Mm -hmm. And I am grateful that we have a polio vaccine but they should be thoroughly tested, thoroughly reviewed, not under emergency use authorization, not forced on the American people, and not under the rubric or umbrella of liability protections that potentially endanger the American people. Would you agree with that sentiment? Uh, totally. I think it's, it's important that whatever the medication is, it receives a fair evaluation and not a biased evaluation. And unfortunately, vaccines in general in the United States, but particularly COVID-19 vaccines, have not been, have not received unbiased scrutiny. 
Ms. Dillon, uh, could you comment a little bit further on, um, you know, you mentioned some, you don't need to repeat the ones in your opening statement, but some of the egregious violations of people's First Amendment rights because churches were shut down or the amount, the extent to which, in your experience, the lockdowns forced upon the American people uh, a, a massive a restriction of their ability to assemble under the Constitution or carry out their First Amendment rights. Could you use the microphone, Ms. Dillon? Yes, sir, thank you for the question. Um, um, Chairman, I'll give you one example. Uh, in our third case that's now set major precedent in the United States Supreme Court on religious liberties, Tandon versus Newsom, the case involved members of a very small congregation who wanted to do Bible study in a private home. And under our governor's restrictions, this was illegal. This was, uh, this was a violation of, of his executive orders. At the same time, those three people could have met in the aisle of a Costco and had a prayer meeting there without violating any rules. This is clearly irrational and it is frankly unconstitutional because I don't have a constitutional right to go to a big box store and buy supersized bags of toilet paper, but I do have a constitutional right to worship with other fellow Americans and the Supreme Court recognized that. Yet another example of this irrationality is the closing of the beaches of Orange County in retaliation for Orange County's attempts to, uh, to pass some reasonable business opening measures. And, and I see my... Uh, um, I, Let me finish the question. In the the, and, and one more I would add is the fact that um, Patio World was forced to close and couldn't sell outdoor furniture because it was a small retailer. But Costco could sell the same products. Costco had better lobbyists than Patio World. These are the irrationalities that we all tolerated and nodded, importantly, that that was necessary to protect the public. It's clearly nonsense. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. I'll now recognize. The I would just seek unanimous consent. I'd like to have unanimous consent to enter into the record the CDC and FDA's March 2023 response to the Florida Department of Health's misleading statements about the COVID-19 vaccine. The letter sets the facts straight on the safety and effectiveness of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, while noting the dangers of perpetuating misinformation about vaccine safety, including unnecessary death, severe illness, and hospitalization. Without objection. Thank you. I will now recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Goodwin, in my opening statement, I argued that in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, public health officials at the local, state, and federal levels acted in good faith, doing the best they could under tremendously difficult circumstances to respond to a novel disease that in the early days of the pandemic was killing almost 1,000 Americans a day before a vaccine was developed. Do you agree with this characterization? It's an accurate characterization. It's an, a characterization that is confirmed by leading medical organizations and scientists that were studying COVID-19 and its impacts at that time. And can you remind us of the conditions that public health officials were operating under at the beginning of the pandemic? They were operating under extreme uh, difficulties during that time, given the number of deaths that were taking place um, at that time, given uh, the number of individuals that were being hospitalized at that time, the grieving of family members whose loved ones were dying and they were working as quickly uh, and as effectively as they possibly could. But it's also worth noting that they were operating under threat as well. And that was something incredibly unique, which I think we cannot forget in these times, the level of violence that was threatened at public health officials, which we've not seen in the last 50 or 100 or 200 years in this country. Thank you. Professor Goodwin, while the Constitution secures our rights, even in an emergency, it also empowers government to secure and protect the public, especially in response to public health emergencies. Can you explain how these two principles work together? Well, these principles work because government has uh, parents patri authority, uh, and that means that in times where there are national security threats, when there are threats to the public health and safety, government can act in order to preserve lives. We've seen this before. This dates, it predates the 1905 Jacobson v. Massachusetts decision, but that case uh, before the United States Supreme Court 
confirmed that states have the authority, the responsibility, in fact, one could say, to step in and engage in measures that will protect the public's health and safety. This is not anything that is new. As I've mentioned before, it actually even predates that decision, and it's something that actually goes back millennia, if you think about it, this idea of trying to protect people when there is a concern for a public health outbreak. This is something that was important to international trade. It was important to trade coming into the United States that we safeguard our harbors, that we safeguard people from being able to come off of ships into the United States. There is a robust history of this, and I offer citations in my written testimony. Thank you, Professor Goodwin. Longstanding Supreme Court precedent grants broad discretion to government officials, and especially those at the state and local levels, to take measures to protect public health, even when individual liberties might be burdened by such steps. Can you elaborate on the balance that government officials must strike when responding to an emergency? This is a really important question because there are times in which a government may, in fact, ex exceed its authority. I mentioned some of those uh, instances. There is a balance in trying to protect and preserve the public's health. It does not mean that individual civil liberties or their constitutional rights go away. Our constitutional rights are not always absolute, even that involving the First Amendment, which is acknowledged by our United States Supreme Court. I do take note and have identified instances in which our government has gone too far. I will give you an example that I think we would all be repulsed by. In 1967, the United States Supreme Court struck down Virginia laws that banned interracial marriage. Now, that might not seem like a public health matter, but the state of Virginia had passed laws that forbade interracial marriage based on this idea that somehow white people would be polluted and their offspring would be polluted and that it would be a public health crisis if white people were to marry people who were non-white. You can see that in the record of the case called Loving v. Virginia. Yeah, Professor Goodman, my last question is, We've heard from some of the other witnesses uh, the terrible tyranny of government ordering uh, people not to go to church and closing schools, and this was uh, unnecessary and terrible. Could you comment on that, please? The effort to try to preserve and protect everyone includes people who practice in their faith. It includes children who want to go to school. The interest of a government in making sure that children do not die during a time of a global pandemic is something that would seem to be logical and that we should all embrace. It was mentioned the importance of vaccination. Vaccinations have done an incredible job in saving individuals' lives, saving children's lives. If a vaccine is not available, as it wasn't at the early part of COVID, the best that government tried to do was to protect children by having them least exposed to the virus. Thank you, I yield back. I thank the ranking member. I will now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I wanna thank you especially for convening this subcommittee to finally begin sifting through the damage that the lockdown left caused to our society by suspending the most fundamental constitutional rights we hold as Americans. Uh, there's a reason the founders created a constitution that sets limits on the powers that the government can wield. As Ronald Reagan once observed, the constitution is not the government's document telling the people what we can and cannot do. The constitution is the people's document telling our government those things that we will allow it to do. And the fact is, we never allowed it to close millions of businesses, lock people in their homes indefinitely, censor dissenters, forbid peaceable assemblies, shut down churches, and yet in the jurisdictions that the left controlled, this is exactly what they did. And they were spectacularly wrong. We knew from the beginning that young people were virtually unaffected by this disease. And we knew that the elderly were at extreme risk. So what did these lockdown leftists do? They closed the schools and forced infected patients into nursing homes. We knew from the beginning that obesity was a major contributing factor to the severity of the disease. And what did these leftists do? They closed the gyms and left the liquor stores open. We knew from the beginning that outdoor transmissions were very rare and that 80% of the infections occurred in people's homes. 
So what did these leftists do? They closed the parks and beaches and forced people into their homes. You know, Sweden never closed its schools, never closed its businesses, never required masks or vaccines. They trusted their citizens to make these decisions for themselves. The United States, unfortunately, imposed all of these mandates in the states controlled by the Democrats. And here's the result. The United States has suffered 3,600 deaths per million from COVID. Sweden suffered 2,600 deaths per million. So let me put it in another way. If we had followed Sweden's policies and had Sweden's results, 340,000 more Americans would be alive today. And that doesn't include the millions of additional excess deaths that these policies caused from suicides, uh, drug and alcohol related deaths, uh, deaths caused by delayed health screenings and deferred health treatments. It is heartbreaking and sickening to think about the butcher's bill from all of this folly. Ms. Goodwin is dead wrong. These policies didn't save lives, they cost lives, hundreds of thousands of lives. And the foolish people responsible for this carnage have yet to be held accountable. I understand why they don't want to answer for the decisions that they advocated, imposed, defended, enforced, and still defend today. But it's time we acknowledge the damage that they did and take steps to assure that they can never do it again. Our Constitution was supposed to protect us from such people, and this time it didn't. So, so the question I have, and I direct it to Ms. Dillon, who's been very active on this, this legal front, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? Thank you for the question, um, Congressman McClintock. I think the biggest thing that Congress could do right now is to overrule by legislation the outdated precedent, Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Um, I hear people in this hearing praising it, at, at the time Jacobson versus Massachusetts was the law, black people couldn't eat at the same places as white people. People like me from Punjab weren't allowed to buy property in the United States. We've had a lot of outdated laws and, and dark times in our country, and that precedent is one of them. And so when I hear passionate advocates for abortion cited as a constitutional right, it is legally premised on tiered scrutiny under the 14th Amendment, which is scrutiny developed by progressive courts to protect our constitutional rights. And that is all I'm asking for, is that that well-established tiered scrutiny be applied today in 2024 to the problems of 2024, not the problems of, two th of, of well, 150 years ago. My time is very limited, ago. but I'd be very, very interested in seeing your, your suggestions in writing on this subject. Uh, I think the Congress, uh, looking back on this now, can see the folly. Uh, but I want to direct the same question to Dr. Latipo real quickly. What's the most important thing we can do to prevent this from ever happening again? Uh, thank you for that question. You know, as you know, I didn't go to law school. I went to medical school, and I have, my answer would be based more in my understanding of people, my relationship with people. And I think that has to do with really helping people, you know, really take in more of their, um, their power as human beings and their right to sovereignty and their right to control what is put into their bodies, which is an absolute right from God. And I think if more people really understood that within themselves, it would be harder for um, our uh, sometimes tyrannically inclined leaders to lead them in, in different directions, which we saw very loudly and clearly into a much heartbreak during the pandemic. Uh, I thank the gentleman from California. I now will recognize the gentlelady from Vermont, Ms. Ballin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Doctor, is it Ladapo? Is that how you pronounce it? Ladapo? Sure, it's all good, either way. No, but how do you pronounce your name? Ladapo. It's Ladapo. It's I like to get it right. Okay, ma'am. Are you a specialist in infectious diseases? I am board certified in internal medicine, and internal medicine doctors take care of a wide variety of Understood. patients. Are you a specialist? In, I asked a very specific question. Diseases. Are you a specialist in infectious diseases? So I am board certified in internal okay, medicine. Okay, the answer I guess is no, with, which is with, okay. We're, with we're moving on. Diseases. Are you a specialist in epidemiology? 
I have PhD I see where you're training going. Okay. in epidemiology. So you, are not a, you are not a specialist in epidemiology I have either. PhD training in epidemiology and biostatistics are you, and health economics. Are you a vaccine researcher? I am not a vaccine researcher. Okay. I'm curious um, why you altered key findings in a state-driven study about COVID-19 in, in your state of Florida. Why did you alter the results of a state-driven survey? If I could, um, Mr. Chair, enter into the record, uh, April 24th, 2023 political article, Florida Surgeon General altered key findings in study on COVID-19 vaccine. Why did you alter the information in that study? Thank you for your question. That is factually incorrect. I did not alter any findings in any study, and I have a, a record of multiple NIH grants as a professor at UCLA and a professor at Florida, and those are not easy to get. The study you're talking about is a study that was very unpopular because we've made, we had a finding that actually was in sync with what you might so expect it, from myocarditis, Dr. Latipo, which is that we found that there was an increased risk of so myocardi when myocarditis and cardiac people, death in young people. in your home state, had said on the record to the press that you altered the study. Are you saying that is inaccurate? I'm saying we have a study that showed that young men were Did at increased you risk alter of cardiac. I've already the answered study. that question, ma'am. I said absolutely not. I have never altered any study. We had a finding of increased cardiac risk that translated into excess deaths in young men in particular. That was a very unpopular finding, but is very consistent with the finding that myocarditis is especially increased in young men. The study was performed by epidemiologists at the Florida Department of Health, not by me. I oversaw the study, and that was the finding, and I, I personally believe that that finding is accurate. I have another question. Um, you had said in multiple op-eds, USA Today, March 26, 2020, Wall Street Journal, April 9th, 2020, that you spent time taking care of patients with COVID-19 at UCLA's flagship hospital, and yet your colleagues at that institution said that was not true. Did you, in fact, while you were on staff at UCLA's flagship hospital, were you the person charged with treating COVID-19 patients? I have taken care of at UCLA Hospital as the attending physician many patients with COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Latipo. Ms. Goodwin, would you agree that longstanding Supreme Court precedent grants broad discretion to government officials and especially those at the state and local levels to make measures to protect public health even when individual liberties might be burdened by such steps? I would agree. And do you think in the, the instance of COVID-19, when we're dealing with a pandemic that we had never seen in our lifetime, do you feel like the steps that were taken were in line with Supreme Court precedent? Based on the evidence that I've shared, that within the first three months, we saw more deaths than the 19 years of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. then I would say yes. What's, what's disturbing to me about this hearing is that there is some idea that folks who were um, in positions of power were somehow trying to uh, manipulate the public for some nefarious means. And I was uh, the majority leader in Vermont, the Vermont Senate, working closely with a Republican governor in Vermont meeting in Rules Committee, which is bipartisan in Vermont, to make decisions in a bipartisan manner to try to protect the health and safety of Vermonters. And I am very sympathetic to the position that Mrs. Gogin? Go Hagen. Go Hagen. I understand, I had two kids in school as well. I'm very sympathetic to how challenging it was. That's true. It was very challenging. The, the gentlelady's time is I will. I will yield back. I would now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. I'll yield my first two minutes to Mr. Massey. Uh, Mr. Latipo, the general lady from Vermont just questioned your credentials. Isn't it true you have a PhD and an MD from Harvard? 
Yes, that's correct, but apparently not enough. I guess not. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to say that the, uh, the Pfizer CEO is a large animal veterinarian, okay? And then the person who actually approved the vaccines at the FDA is a hematologist oncologist who ran off the two top vaccine scientists at the FDA, Marion Gruber and <laughs> Philip Krauss, because they said that they would not skip steps to approve the vaccine. And then they also had hesitation about the boosters. He said, not everybody's gonna need a booster, especially not eight months after they've received the vaccine. But they were the vaccine experts working at the FDA who were removed of their responsibilities by a guy who didn't replace them with vaccine experts. How do I know this? I was in a transcribed interview for seven hours with this gentleman from the FDA yesterday. And what we also found out is that the FDA, whose role is to regulate the manufacturers, to make sure that what they say is true, that the claims can be verified. The FDA itself was going out and making one minute videos saying things that not only did the vaccine manufacturers not claim, for instance, that their vaccines could stop or slow the spread, but the vaccine manufacturers never asked for approval of to be able to say, and that the vaccine manufacturers would have gone to jail, the FDA would have probably arrested somebody if they had made the claims that the FDA itself was making. So we'll, we'll find out more about that later. Um, you know, well, let's talk very quickly, Ms. Dillon, about the PREP Act um, or Mr. Latipo. Is, is that something that Congress could remedy? Well, the PREP Act effectively protects the big drug companies from the defector products that they make and I find it as a civil rights lawyer very problematic that that type of protection is granted freely by the government without even requiring anything on the part of the drug manufacturers. I know we want to promote industry, but I think it is, it is time to re-examine the PREP Act and roll it back. I think it's medical malpractice martial law, and I'll yield back. I think, Mr. Massey, you're picking up. I'm going to pick up right there. There was a case decided by the North Carolina Court of Appeals back in March in which a student athlete, minor, uh, went for a compelled COVID test and, uh, and was administered a COVID vaccine without his parents' uh, permission and without his consent. They just said, give it to him. Uh, he, he sued, and it was the PREP Act that, was, that the Court of Appeals had just said they were constrained to hold, uh, completely deprive the parents of any uh, claim for relief. Now, they didn't, uh, have any f they didn't have federal constitutional claims there, but I note that in the Ninth Circuit, Ms. Dillon, in February, in uh, Maney versus Brown, the PREP Act was cited and it said that not only did Congress immunize and, and eliminate almost any claim, that, you know, statutory or tort claim, it also eliminated any claim under Section 1983, any constitutional claim. So it seems to me that there's, you know, that with the PREP Act, the Congress has so sweepingly deprived Americans of their fundamental constitutional rights that the only conceivable claim I can think of would be an ex parte young prospective injunctive claim, and you'd have to know they're gonna do something, right? You can't have any claim at all if you've, if you've been damaged by the violation of a constitutional right based on a vaccine administration. I, I would agree with that. I was discussing this with a civil rights lawyer yesterday, um, and you know, the problems go beyond this. They include that under restrictions of the Bivens uh, decisions yeah. in the United States Supreme Court, there is no uh, you know, sort of fundamental constitutional claim that can be brought absent some legislative enablement. Right. And so I think Congress really needs to look at this problem of preemption as a significant one that erodes states' rights. And in this case, there is a competing fundamental constitutional right, the right of parents to control their children's education, which has been guaranteed time and again by the Constitution and is effectively abridged in the case that you right. just mentioned involving the forced vaccination of a child against the parents' parents. Absolutely. Got one more thing to try to squeeze in, and that is Talk about this WHO treaty, this WHO treaty. What is the design there? You know, the biggest thing that concerns me is that as of now, if we had another crisis emerge, it almost looks like the same events would be repeated. And some are out there, I think, trying to make sure that government, that the, that the factors limiting government, like litigation in the Constitution and so forth, will be even less effective by ceding power to international bodies like the WHO. Can you speak to that treaty we hear so much about? Absolutely. So we had a mere iota here or there of some fundamental liberties being recognized by the federal courts. And under this uh, WHO treaty, we would effectively be ceding all such discretion 
uh, to international bodies. We've seen how that's worked out in real life in many other spheres of our lives. This is a country based on federalist principles. So generally speaking, states should be able to pass laws that protect rights. Judges should apply modern, not ancient constitutional principles dating back to uh, bad eras of our country. And instead, we are going in the opposite direction with considering treaties that would cede that to countries that share none of our egalitarian values. My time has expired. I think the gentleman from North Carolina, uh, we're going to continue on our side of the aisle. Uh, if the gentleman from California is ready, I will recognize him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at this point, there's really no room for reasonable debate that the extreme and extended lockdown and school closure policies were a historic mistake. And in light of this, you see two basic tactics for those who are responsible for these policies. Uh, the first is to say, well, we just didn't know at the time. Uh, so here's a quote from perhaps the individual who did the most damage during COVID of anyone in the country, if not the world, and that's the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, who recently said on Meet the Press, I think we would have done everything differently. I think all of us, in terms of our collective wisdom, we've evolved. We didn't know what we didn't know. We're experts in hindsight. So Dr. Ladapo, you're the Surgeon General of Florida. My question for you is how did you and the governor of Florida manage to time travel into the future and gain access uh, to knowledge and wisdom that is only available to the likes of the governor of California uh, in retrospect? Right, uh, thank you for your question. The, what was different with the policies that the governor enthusiastically endorsed and frankly had company in every state just about with the exception of a few including Governor DeSantis was that those were actually not classic public health principles. These are published studies of and published papers about how to approach pandemics and public health crises. And one of those principles is to as much as possible help people maintain their normal routines. Old published papers state very clearly that the, uh, the benefits, if any, of things like forcing people to stay home are unlikely to be realized. This is not new knowledge. This is old stuff. But unfortunately, none of it was, you know, was, was uh, followed when the COVID-19 pandemic started. Well, thank you for your common sense and science-based policies. Uh, you know, millions of people, particularly kids in Florida, um, are, are much better off because of it. Now, the second tactic, first tactic is to simply say, well, we didn't know at the time. The second tactic is simply to deny that these events occurred uh, altogether. We've seen that actually in the testimony of several Biden administration officials uh, in this Congress. You had uh, the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, despite being an enthusiastic advocate for child vaccine mandates, denied in testimony before the Education Committee that he had supported that. You had uh, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra, from my own state of California, uh, testify, quote, we never forced anyone to do anything, even though he oversaw the heinous two-year-old mask mandate uh, for Head Start. And perhaps most incredibly, you had Douglas Parker, the head of OSHA, also from California, who was responsible for the Biden administration's attempt to institute a vaccine mandate on 70 million Americans, who flatly denied in testimony before our committee that that had occurred. So it's this attempt, sort of like the memory hole that they have in 1984 to simply pretend that these events never occurred, or that it was all a bad dream. So Ms. Dillon, uh, you know, you lived through what I lived through in California. Uh, you fought back uh, as valiantly as anyone in our state against these abuses for the sake of sort of preserving our historic memory of what life actually was like in California during this period. Could you just give us a few snapshots of sort of some of the worst abuses that we all had to endure? Well, thank you, Congressman Kiley. And by the way, you were also a fellow warrior in that battle and went to court to challenge our governor. I appreciate that as a fellow lawyer. Um, to me, the absurdity that certain people could cross county lines uh, during the pandemic, but our governor forbade the rest of us from crossing county lines unless we had an essential purpose is one of those crazy issues. The fact that you needed a vaccine passport to eat in restaurants uh, well into the pandemic when, in fact, Governor Newsom uh, with glee ate in the French laundry restaurant that was cut off from the rest of us. The fact that Governor Newsom and other wealthy California elites were able to educate their own children in their backyards and pods and relegated the most vulnerable members of our society, inner city children, children for whom English is a second language in Los Angeles County, to destroyed 
careers and education to a lifetime of less earning and less liberty, really, is an outrage. And everyone just simply wants to say, whoa, well, mistakes were made. You know, we did the best we could at the same time. In fact, there were different rules for the elites in California and different rules for the rest of us. And the fact that judges pointed to Jacobson and said, Ms. Dillon, we're not talking about uh, deferential or rational basis scrutiny. No scrutiny is due to the government's action in shutting us down. And so my fear as a civil rights lawyer is that with the snap of a finger or the stroke of a pen, the very same civil liberties uh, catastrophe could happen to us again unless Congress takes action to right that wrong. Thank you, I yield back. I will now recognize the uh, ranking member and the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. Um, Professor Goodwin, I, I do appreciate the dispassionate and accurate review of constitutional law that you've provided us with, with respect to public health authority and particularly vaccine mandates. Um, because today we've heard some pretty astonishing attacks upon that authority and suggestions that uh, Congress should overrule centuries of common law and Supreme Court holdings with respect to what kind of actions the government can take in the face of a public health emergency. And I think we just over, we just heard um, advocacy for ending um, vaccine requirements for students attending public schools. Could you comment on those suggestions? Let me refer to something that I've uh, submitted in, in my statements that the CDC reports and finds that between 1994 and 2014, 700,000 uh, American children were saved from death and over 32, uh, 322 million cases of childhood illnesses were prevented due to vaccination. The American Academy of Pediatrics states that most childhood vaccines are 90 to 99% effective in preventing diseases. I think it's been so long that we've lived with children being able to go outside and play, being able to run, being able to have a fulfilling life that we ignore what it was like before we had vaccines, what it was like for children who were struck with polio what the threats were for their families, the fear, the concern. We've been able to have a flourishing life in the United States because of vaccines. They do work, they are safe, they are efficacious, and that doesn't mean that there aren't sometimes um, adverse results. The same could be said with seat belts. We understand the importance of there being seat belts. Does that mean that there are times in which a life might uh, not be saved due to seat belts. Sometimes that is the case, but we know overwhelmingly millions upon Americans have been saved by seat belts and regulations that people use them. Yeah, I, I think it kind of brings us back to one of the things I spoke about in, in my opening remarks, which is that freedoms have consequences. So if you want to exercise a freedom not to get a vaccination, then that may impact your ability to decide where you're going to work or what uh, educational opportunities your children will have or whether um, you can attend church or other things when we're in the midst of a public health crisis. I mean, we've heard some really extreme examples. Um, yes, in, in my community, there were um, restrictions on public gatherings, um, but people adapted. You know, we still have more people attending the virtual church ceremony at my church than attending in person. People had services outside. Um, schools adapted to online learning and, and implemented mask mandates. So um, these weren't complete restrictions on, on people's lives, and it's, it's a little bit disingenuous to suggest that there weren't workarounds. Um, well, was there something um, you wanted to yeah, add? Well, Americans adapted because they were compassionate, they cared about their neighbors, they cared about their family members, and for that reason, they did adapt. There were people, uh, many of us, who um, suffered something during that time. My daughter was being educated in Europe during that time. It was a time in which I had to see her by looking on a screen in order to be with my daughter because the restrictions also included travel. But I cared about her health. I cared about her safety. I wanted her to be safe, and so that was an adaptation, and many people made them, and we've been able to come to a space where we could have a hearing such as this, 
where it looks like almost everyone in this room is unmasked. Okay. Um, we did, um, you did mention the fact that sometimes um, public health imperatives or lack of imperatives are visited most harshly upon our most vulnerable people. Um, one of the concerns during the COVID crisis was that people who were particularly vulnerable to that virus um, could die if their neighbors didn't um, observe mask mandates or vaccination requirements. Isn't that the baseline purpose of um, public health requirements? And that remains the case today. There remains individuals who are vulnerable, who are immunologically vulnerable, and who have to guard their health. One of the things that we learned during COVID is that families that had members who were anti-vaccination, who did not believe in COVID, experienced the deaths of those relatives. There were families that learned from that kind of rhetoric. At the end of the day, what we want to do is to be able to preserve and protect as much life as possible. And at the same time, it is important that we understand civil liberty, civil rights, and how they are balanced out. And we could have that conversation. And I think one example is with Casey Hickox, and we could talk about in the main case. Thank you. I thank the ranking member. I will now recognize Mr. Fry, the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for having this hearing today. I think it's really important. We've examined a lot of ways in which COVID-19 was used against the American people, that bureaucratic uh, processes were put in place to restrict the freedom of movement and freedoms in general uh, for the American people. But I want to highlight something that I think is very essential to the preservation of our republic, and that's the, the right to vote. Uh, during COVID-19, processes by unelected bureaucrats were put into place to restrict uh, the right of people to vote freely. The, Things were changed contrary to a state legislature that secretaries of state were allowed to do things uh, within their state uh, to change the way in which people voted. And of course, a lot of that has been challenged. Um, and despite, and quite frankly, when you look at what was changed, this was despite public health officials saying that in-person voting was completely safe. Uh, so, Ms. Dillon, I want to turn to you. To what extent did COVID-19 serve to change the election processes in this country in the lead up to the election? Um, well, thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, COVID-19 was used as an excuse by mainly Democrat lawmakers to one way ratchet down the election integrity that we enjoy as Americans. For example, you just referred to um, you know, the way that voting should be safe. Well, if masks worked and social distancing worked and we were all required to, uh, to observe those measures, why couldn't we have voted in person using those measures just like we all went to the grocery stores and did our other business that way? Uh, it is the fact that in, in, um, in combination with, with the fact that we have unclean voter rolls in the United States, combine that with all male voting, and you suddenly have a system where there are millions of unaccounted ballots floating around and not tied to voters who are entitled to vote. And unfortunately, many states, right and left, red and blue, used those COVID restrictions, uh, used, used the COVID restrictions as a cover to change those laws. And now that COVID is effectively over, as, as it was pointed out, none of us are wearing masks here today, which by the way, the paper masks don't work anyway. Um, why haven't we returned to those previously well-respected documented ways of safe and secure voting? And the net result is that many Americans have lost confidence in the accuracy of our elections and don't want to vote anymore because they don't believe their votes are going to be accurately counted. This is a significant problem in voter confidence. Ms. Dillon, do you think that, that the, the motivation then in the lead up to the election was, was about public health and public safety, or was it more about changing the way in which Americans vote? Well, I think in most instances, many of the restrictions were a well-intentioned but wrong attempt to protect public safety, but also an exercise and a flex of power. In the case of the voting requirements, I think it was entirely for purposes of loosening one man, one vote, voter ID, and uh, clean voter rolls leading to secure elections. What do you think are the long-term effects of those changes on, on uh, American elections? Well, as a volunteer political figure in my state and nationally, what I have heard from thousands of Americans is that they believe as a result of the uh, crazy rules or suspension of rules we saw in 2020, including citizens not being allowed to exercise their constitutional right to observe the counting of ballots, um, 
counting taking place outside the views of cameras, no security that we're normally entitled to, ballots showing up, suspension of, of the uh, enforcement of laws, including laws regarding ballot harvesting, um, regarding uh, drop boxes and so forth, that many Americans don't think their vote counts anymore. That's, that's a very big problem for, for our country. And at the same time, the bigger problem, of course, is that the elections are not necessarily accurate when you don't have one man, one vote, when you have literally tens of thousands of ballots delivered from California to other states and some people voting those ballots. Ms. Dillon, how do you think Congress can work to, to one, prevent that from ever happening again, but two, to, to be part of the solution to roll back some of those policies? Because again, I agree with you, and in fact, some cases, uh, Trump v. Uh, Booker in, in Pennsylvania, you know, some courts have come in and stepped in and said that these secretaries of state, that these boards of elections have stepped too far. So to what extent uh, can Congress uh, lend to, to fix this problem, to make sure that it never happens again, and that we, we enhance that right to vote for all Americans? Well, for the most part, uh, sir, I actually believe that Congress should stay out of it. And HR1 and other rules like that should be rejected by right-thinking people. But to the extent that Congress participates in federal elections and funds them, uh, they should insist that the money goes to states that honor laws. We have a couple of federal laws on the books, Help America Vote Act um, and you know, other, uh, other restrictions. And I think that we need to make sure that uh, states should not spam the entire populace with ballots that aren't attached to legitimate voters like we see in California. We have, in fact, Los Angeles County in 2017 was found to have over one million people on the voter rolls who are not entitled to vote. They were dead, duplicates, moved, et cetera. This is wrong. Unanimous. Thank you for that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, the gentlelady. Yeah, since we've moved from vaccine conspiracies to voting conspiracies, I just want to have unanimous consent to introduce an article entitled, Trump politicized mail-in voting in 2020, but it came to Pennsylvania with strong Republican support. Without objection, Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My colleagues on the left keep telling me about how Donald Trump is a fascist and how they think he's the next Mussolini. And what we experienced during the pandemic from Democrat governors and local leaders with their hypocritical and unscientific policies is the closest thing you'll ever see to fascism in the history of this country. They told us to stay in our homes. They told us not to go to church. They told us not to attend funerals and only leave our homes for what they deemed to be essential travel. And when we rightly questioned the efficacy of their decrees, they told us to trust the science. Well, I'm about to show you what real fascism looks like. and I'm about to show you what their science really looks like. During the pandemic, something struck me. People weren't allowed to use jogging or biking trails even in my hometown of Houston, Texas. And speaking of Houston, our Democrat mayor ordered around 500 basketball nets removed from public courts because God forbid anyone have any fun outside to get essential vitamins and fresh air. Skate parks were filled with sand in California so people couldn't play outside and again get fresh air. In Malibu, paddleboarders were arrested for the crime of paddleboarding alone in the middle of the ocean. However, one group of people were exempt from lockdowns, from mandates, and apparently from the virus itself. Now, I'm of the opinion that this group of people should have their blood tested because who knows? Maybe they had the cure before we had the vaccine. And I think you know what group I'm talking about. That's right, I am talking about the righteous George Floyd protesters. According to one political article, these protesters risked their health and their life for, quote, the health of our nation. And do you remember those same health professionals telling us to stay home or else you're gonna kill grandma? 1,000 of those same health professionals signed a letter saying, don't shut down protests using coronavirus concerns as an excuse. Interesting, as an excuse. People lost their jobs and their livelihood in this country because they chose not to take the vaccine. People weren't allowed into restaurants because they didn't use their, they didn't show their vaccine papers, I mean their, their vaccine card. Our schools were shut down and our children were sent home. The result, youth suicide rates increased dramatically and children lost years of education that they'll never get back. 
Dr. Godapo, thank you for being here, sir. Yes or no, in your professional medical experience and Harvard education as the Surgeon General of Florida, are Democrats and liberals immune to COVID-19? <clears throat> <laughs> no, no, sir, to the best of my knowledge. A follow up question to that. <laughs> You set Florida's response to COVID-19, and how would you explain bodies not piling up in Los Angeles after the George Floyd protests? For one, there was very, very, very little transmission outdoors. Uh, that was a major part. Uh, most of the protesters from what I saw were young people that probably also contributed, but there was almost no transmission outdoors, and it broke my heart when they pulled the, the basketball hoops in the playgrounds that I was taking my kids to in Los Angeles. I mean, I could have, you know, I'll stop it there, but broke Thank my you. heart. Thank you for your response. Much like the vast majority of liberal policies, this rules for thee and not for me. And apparently that also applies to COVID lockdowns and mandates. It was okay to make exceptions for when the left believes was a righteous cause. The left said it was safe for 100,000 people to protest, 100,000 people in the middle of a pandemic, but they were giving you grief for letting people sit on the beach or paddleboard in the middle of the ocean. Why? Because in the case of, George, of the George Floyd protest, it was a righteous cause in their opinion. And by the way, it wasn't just protest, it was rioting, it was looting, it was attacking and burning a police station in Minneapolis. It was rioting in front of the White House to such an extent that President Trump had to be ushered into a bunker. And all this was acceptable because it was deemed righteous by the left. Speaking of righteous causes, let's take a look at Black Panther. I'm, I'm sorry, that's Kunta Kente. I'm, I'm sorry, Nancy Pelosi, Wakanda, Wakanda forever. This is the absurdity of the COVID-19 lockdowns, liberal mandates, and of course, even a little cultural appropriations. This is very ridiculous. We must never allow something like this to ever happen again in this country. It's why we have a constitution in the first place, to protect us from the exact type of government overreach that we saw during the pandemic. No matter what side of the political aisle that you, that you find yourself, you should always be on the side of freedom and preserving our rights via the constitution. And that's why many of us walked away from the pandemic and the protests that followed, asking the question, were the COVID restrictions really about public safety or were they about winning an election? You decide. Thank you for being here. I thank the gentleman from Texas. I'll now, I'll now recognize the gentleman from North Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I was going to ask a bunch of questions about strict scrutiny, rational basis, and all of those things, but eventually this all goes away. And I think I have a at least a little bit of different take. I had two kids in two different school systems during COVID. Uh, and Dr. Ladopo, does COVID spread differently when you have to take half the kids out of a classroom and then let them all go to football practice together the same night? Um, no, no, sir, it doesn't. And you can't wear a mask under a football helmet, but if you take your mask off in school, you will at worst, get asked to put it on by a teacher very in a different way, and more importantly, uh, I mean, they could lose government, state funding, local funding, if they do that. Uh, does a mask work better in a classroom than on a football field? Turns out it's, it works about the same in both okay. settings. Is there a difference between Menards being open and a locally owned business? To the owners, yes, but probably not to the virus. Is there some super secret ventilation system I'm not aware of at Menards that, that local businesses are incapable of having? I actually couldn't comment on that, but I uh, probably would assume not. When a bar, when the clock turns 11 p.m. at a bar, does COVID become more contagious? In some precincts, no, I'm kidding. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't become more contagious. <laughs> These are lesson. all the ridiculous things that happened in my state. And I don't blame the teacher. And I actually don't blame the public health officials. I blame politicians on the right side of the aisle, the left side of the aisle, local officials, state officials, federal officials, who all hit under their desks and abdicated their responsibility to people who had never been elected to anything. And if you care about vaccines, which I do, then you should care about the fact that we were told COVID vaccine would give you immunity to COVID. 
And then we were told it won't give you immunity to COVID, but it'll keep you out of the hospital. But then we were told that you have to take booster one, booster two, booster five, booster 17, and then you still have to socially distance and wear masks, but not at football practice. People aren't stupid. And when they get lied to constantly, and they get told something, and nobody ever comes out and says things, we, you, masks don't help stop COVID. Well, what we found out is we didn't have enough masks. So we're being lied to. And then once we had enough masks, we wanted to make everybody wear masks. And people in long-term nursing care facilities died alone because their families couldn't come in there. And the, and, the, and the facility that ran it had no choice because their federal dollars were tied to it. These are all the real things that happen. So you know why we need to pass laws? So it never happens again. And I don't care about a Supreme Court case from 40 years ago or 50 years ago or 70 years ago. I care about the fact that people need to be protected because civil liberties only matter when they matter. And when you have the head health official on CNN saying, who cares about civil liberties at a time like this? Then you need your elected officials to stand up and say, we do. We do. Because that's the only time they matter. All the best free speeches, speech cases in front of the US Supreme Court are with undeniably bad people. All the best Fourth Amendment cases in front of the US Supreme Court, it's not a school teacher sitting next to the defense attorney when those cases are decided. It is because constitutional rights and civil liberties have to matter all the time. And they have to matter at our worst moments in time. Otherwise, they don't matter ever. And so as we walk through this, and I appreciate you all being here, and I appreciate from each side of this, but we can talk about strict, strict scrutiny, a rational basis, or dealing with another case, but the world failed at COVID. And it wasn't the teacher, and it wasn't the restaurant owner, and it wasn't the small business owner. It was the people that got elected to represent people in times of crisis that hid under their desk and let somebody whose only job was medical make decisions that affected far more things than medical decisions. And also, I just think we didn't learn a whole lot about risk. And with that, and there's a difference between the front end of COVID and after about six weeks, and we made the most ridiculous decisions on behalf of our citizens and we allowed them to happen, and people looked at it and they knew they were ridiculous. You know why people don't trust vaccines as much anymore? Because they got lied to about vaccines for two years straight. And if we care about smallpox, and if we care about all of those things, we should be held to account for that as a government. And with that, I yield back. I very much thank the gentleman from North Dakota, and I will recognize the gentleman from Wyoming. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Call me a bit of a skeptic when I hear the Democrats talk about this is the, that we have to do these things just to save one life, just one life. It is imperative that we destroy our Constitution and take away the constitutional rights of 330 million people just to save one life. When the Democrat Party right now is more radical on abortion than at any time in the history of the world, their position on abortion and a woman's right to kill her baby is the most extreme position that they have ever taken. So I'm just a little bit skeptical when they talk about how critically important it was to force people to use masks or to be vaccinated just to save that one life when they've taken the position on abortion that they have. Uh, Ms. Gehagen? Go Hagen. As a parent and former teacher, can you describe the harm that the closure of schools and re remote learning inflicted on your children? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, well, as I said in my, in my oral testimony and, and went into greater detail in my written testimony, that uh, mostly for my, my youngest son, uh, because he was a junior when schools closed and then his entire senior year was, was uh, virtual, uh, the best word I can use to describe that is it just delegitimized school for him. And I know it's not just him, it's, it's many of his peers. I've, I've talked to lots of parents. I was involved with uh, parents in my community trying to get schools to reopen, and it's the same thing. That, and, and I think you can see that with the chronic absenteeism that we're now dealing with. Yes. Not only did it delegitimize school for the students, but it delegitimized it for the parents as well, because let's be honest, the parents are the ones that need to prompt their children to get to school every day, and they're not seeing the need to do that quite as much. Um, I was just told that I think 60% of the students here, in, the high school students in DC are chronically absent, which is, that's a big problem. That, you know, so that's and a lot of that stems from the policy decisions that were made during COVID. 
Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Did you know that the declines in reading and math achievement during the pandemic were among the largest declines observed in a single assessment cycle of the National Assessment of Educational Progress Program? Yes, I am very aware of that. And can you describe how students with special educational needs may have been particularly affected by school closures, mass mandates, and other COVID-19 measures? So those stories are, are, are particularly heartbreaking because the students with special needs were, were especially hurt by, by those policies. And the parents who really depended on the, the special education teachers who are tremendous at what they do. Um, they, they, were, they were disconnected from them. It is, I actually have a special education degree. It is very challenging to provide special education via a screen. Um, in many cases, it's nearly impossible. Are you aware that studies have shown that wearing a face mask in school has led to an increase in anxiety and depression and a decrease in communication and socialization skills development among our students? I am aware of that and I witness that on a, on a very regular basis. I volunteer in a school that was actually started um, because their schools were closed. This is an urban school and, the, and I walked in and we were never masked in that school. And the students in that school who were just failing in their public schools are now thriving, but they were never masked. They're very social, They're, they communicate. In fact, one has even testified in Frankfort, Kentucky um, in front of the education committee. So there, I can see the vast difference between the students who were masked and shut out and the students who were allowed to be in person, unmasked and, and fully children. That is a, that, that's an excellent observation to make. And uh, as a civil rights attorney, I think one of the things that was so stunning to me was how readily our uh, elected officials and even our, our um, unelected officials were willing to go down the road of absolutely ignoring every aspect of the Bill of Rights by claiming that this was an emergency. And while I think for the first couple of weeks, people could understand, we didn't quite know what COVID-19 was. We didn't know how it was going to affect us. We didn't know what it was going to do. But pretty quickly, we figured it out. Pretty quickly, we figured it out. And then at that point, what we figured out and what we learned even more was that there are an awful lot of totalitarians that live among us. And they want to control every aspect of our lives. And we see it in so many areas. We see it with the global warming hysteria. We see it with this pandemic hysteria. We see it with their effort to try to turn over uh, the decision-making authority of the United States to the WHO and the UN. I wanna thank all of you for coming here today, being willing to testify, being willing to make sure that the, the historical record is accurate because we can't prevent something from this like this from happening in the future unless we're prepared for it. So thank you for being here, thank you for being in the fight and thank you for working to protect our civil liberties uh, unlike so many others on the other side who are unwilling to do that, thank you. I thank the gentlelady from Wyoming, and I certainly want to thank all of the witnesses. If you notice, we've been scurrying around. We've got votes that have been called, so we are going to be uh, running over to the floor to catch our votes, which are about to close out over there. This concludes today's hearing. We thank the witnesses for appearing before the committee today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. I also want to make clear, I think it was Ms. Ballant had made a, a, a consent request. She started asking a question and I didn't say without objection. But without objection, her consent request is in the record. So uh, with that, uh, the hearing is adjourned.